I'm Willie Kerry, uh, the author of Blue Earland Foxtrot. Willie, what is Blue Earland Foxtrot about? What's the story? It's uh, an adventure story set in the 1970s and 80s in South Africa, uh, a period of, of political turmoil, and it tracks a group of students who find themselves in opposition to the apartheid regime um, as they try to make sense of, of the their place in the apartheid order. And it's a presumably autobiographical, the, the, the student life of the book, is it? Yes, it, it draws on some of my own history as a student at the University of Stellenbosch. And these students are having fun, really, up mm. until quite close to the yeah. end. Yeah. Well, I think the, there was a kind of... Um, uh, exuberant culture uh, around smoking a lot of grass, uh, listening to the music of the time and, and uh, a kind of sex, drugs and rock and roll environment. How did that <coughs> fit in with the more um, puritanical traditions of left politics? No one is purely puritanical in, in South Africa. There was a great deal of excitement in the time, whatever you were involved with and um, South Africans do know how to party. To start with, the students seem to be involved in things like letting off bombs and shooting and things like that, none of which you seem to take terribly seriously, and then the UDF comes along. Yes. Well, I think that was a, a kind of step change in, in uh, that period when um, the possibility of being part of a greater movement with uh, historic goals of ending apartheid became possible and the group of students in a way fragments into this greater movement uh, uh, an anti-apartheid movement that spread through the whole whole world but it seems, <coughs> it seems almost like the second world war in which they, they meet different people mm. and they, they're, they're, they become part of the wider country rather than a little group unto themselves. Yes, yes, it was an extraordinary time when uh, you could cross all the, the boundaries in, in a, a racially segregated environment. Uh, as long as you were for the movement against apartheid, you were accepted, and there was a great um, uh, sense of being thrown into a greater uh, South Africa than, than one had been able to do so under apartheid conditions. One of the issues the book raises is whether the apartheid regime was a cousin of Nazism. Yes, it, it explores a, a, a certain family resemblance. Um, the, one of the, the main characters, the Prime Minister B.J. Forster, uh, was interned uh, during the Second World War as a Nazi sympathizer. And the book poses the question, well, what is such a person? Can you be a reformed Nazi? Um, isn't there something about the practice of apartheid which perpetuates a, a race-based form of oppression? And, and I think that's still a question today because if we misrecognize our history, then we may be condemned to repeat it. And that is another theme of the book, which is really the parallels between the apartheid period and what is happening in contemporary South Africa. Yes, I think that was one of the, the motivating factors for writing it, was that I noticed these strange parallels between the corruption uh, and the political excess of, of the 70s apartheid state and the current descent into a kind of lawless state that we're seeing under <coughs> under Jacob Zuma. <coughs> and parallels between Moldegate and the New Age newspaper. Yes, uh, it, it's, it's very striking that in, in, in the 70s um, the apartheid regime sets up a, an English-speaking newspaper as a propaganda instrument. And here under Zuma we see the Gupta family setting up essentially a propaganda instrument in, in support of the Zuma government. 
Uh, and the question is, well, why is that? Why are there these strange parallels? Um, one can look at the Soweto uprising and the, uh, the Marikana massacre a few years ago. Uh, one can look at the obsession that the Forster regime has with nuclear power and weapons and the current obsession of the Zuma government with uh, nuclear power and, and a, deal with the a deal with the Russians, yes. Yeah. Uh, and the, it's, it's something that I try and explore in the novel. Um, and what I wonder about it is, is perhaps what is common is that the, we had a period of Afrikaner nationalism and that was followed particularly uh, under Thabo Mbeki and uh, Jacob Zuma with a, a kind of exclusive African nationalism. And perhaps that's where these similarities lie. The book's not all serious, is it? Similar to the, the kind of um, picaresque novels of the, of the 18th century. Uh, Don Quixote and Henry Fielding's Tom Jones that engage with politics, engage with sexuality, and engage with, with a kind of satirical critique of, of society. And what's your next novel going to be about? I'm going to go back to 1903 and look at the, the decade in which the, the, the Union of South Africa is forged out of the Anglo-Boer War and the emergence of the uh, African National Congress in that period. And there are a lot of uh, interesting political figures in the form of uh, General Smuts, uh, Alfred Milner, um, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, and Sol Plaiki, who will play a part in, in the novel. And one thing we didn't talk about earlier was how the ANC has kind of um, gripped the liberation narrative made it its monopoly. How has that occurred? Well, it's it's um, a, a process in which um, I think particularly uh, the under the the Tabo and Berkey era. Uh, when the ANC tried to represent itself as the sole liberator of the country with the sole legitimacy to rule. And, um, and of course there is, is the whole mythology of, of Nelson Mandela behind it, um, the, the attempts to play down the role of someone like Steve Biko uh, to recognize that there were other th streams in the, the liberation process and I think like, it's like the UDF that we talked about earlier. Like the, the UDF, the United Democratic Front as an internal uh, relatively open movement for democracy yeah. and, um, and I think it's all now coming unstuck in the present. Uh, the, the realities of current South African social and economic life uh, and the conduct, particularly of the ANC in power, are uh, undermining that. And the notion that the ANC will rule till Jesus comes is now being ridiculed. Um, and um, we're seeing the kind of crumbling of that liberation myth.